This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Arctic chill. The G7 meets in Quebec, but as trade tensions with the U.S. mount, the world will be watching. Will the president get a frosty reception? New boss, Verizon's deal-making CEO, retires, replaced by an executive who could reshape the Dow component's future. Reclaiming the crown in the race to build the world's most powerful computer, the U.S. is back on top. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Friday, June the 8th. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Well, things were a little chilly north of the border. World leaders gathered in Quebec for a meeting of the G7, a summit of the major industrialized nations. Historically, global issues are discussed. There's usually no drama and little tension. But this year, it's different. And it's because of mounting trade tensions between the U.S. and some of its closest allies. Kayla Tausche is in Quebec City for us tonight. Blue skies and smiles belied the discord behind the scenes in Charlevoix. Tensions boiling over among allies of the United States after President Trump imposed tariffs on steel and aluminum imports, citing national security risk. UK Prime Minister Theresa May called for an immediate rollback. Europeans pushed the US to abide by world trading rules that have been in place for over 20 years. As world leaders met, companies pushed for action too. In the U.S., the Business Roundtable urged engagement, not friction with allies. In Canada, executives like Peter Simons, the CEO of Canada's oldest family-run business, worries leaders are missing the opportunity to move forward. My greatest fear is that we, we don't have any historical perspective and we continue to apply ideas, uh, past that, ideas that are obsolete to modern-day problems. The G7 family feud follows a string of defeats for European leaders, failing to keep the U.S. in the Iran nuclear deal and the Paris Climate Accord. Before leaving, President Trump added a new curveball for the one-time group of eight, bringing Russia back into the fold. Russia should be in the meeting. It should be a part of it. You know, whether you like it or not, and it may not be politically correct, but we have a world to run. And in the G7, which used to be the G8, they threw Russia out. They should let Russia come back in because we should have Russia at the negotiating table. Russia was expelled in 2014 after invading Crimea. European officials say the U.S. should strengthen the G7 instead of adding new challenges. Canada's foreign minister said Russia continues to flout the rules of liberal democracies. There are no grounds whatsoever for bringing Russia with its current behavior back into the G7. At the end of the G7, countries traditionally issue a joint communique, a pledge toward shared priorities. In the past, free trade has been among them. Freeland said that joint pledge is still in the works, and a White House official said it's still the hope the U.S. signs on. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kayla Tausche in Quebec City, Canada. Meanwhile, the U.S. pork industry finds itself in the middle of the tough talk on trade. 25 percent tariffs imposed by China have now been followed by tariffs from Mexico, and that is starting to squeeze American farmers. Jane Wells is in Des Moines, Iowa for us tonight. America's hog producers have a beef with the trade war. Every time we get a free trade agreement, our exports have grown. And so, you know, exports are a very important part of my business. This is one industry that has a trade surplus. Last year's exports reached record volumes, which may be one reason why it's now being targeted with retaliatory tariffs by some of its biggest international customers. If you think of the pork industry like a pig, more than a quarter of it is exports. And 40% of that is Mexico and China. That's the problem. Mexico is America's largest international buyer by volume of American pork, second largest by the amount of money it spends, $1.5 billion last year. And China is right behind it. Our producers depend on global markets, and, and we need those global markets to be successful as an industry. There are a lot of Trump supporters here at the World Pork Expo, and despite the tariffs, you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone expressing anger at the president. 
And sure, it's going to be a difficult time. We're going to take one for the team here, but I really believe that we'll survive through and be stronger as we come out of this. Yeah, I think probably sure it's going to have some effect, but uh, you know, on the other hand, we need we need fair play in this deal straight across the board. So I guess I support our president on that on that policy. Still, tariffs may make U.S. pork less competitive at a time when supplies are up and production is at record levels. With less bacon going abroad, more of it will stay home, prices will go down, and at least that'll be good news for consumers this summer. For Nightly Business Report, Jane Wells, Des Moines, Iowa. By the way, Reuters is reporting that Mexican authorities will allow U.S. farmers to sell some pork to Mexico through import quotas despite the tariffs. On Wall Street, investors were able to shrug off some of the tensions surrounding the G7, sending stocks to a higher close on the last trading day of the week. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 75 points to 25,316. The Nasdaq added 10, and the S&P 500 was up 8. For the week, the major indexes were all solidly higher. The Dow posted its largest weekly gain in three months. Big changes are coming to Verizon. The Dow component has picked its next CEO. He's a technology expert who could reshape that company's future. That news sent shares of Verizon up slightly in today's trade. Julia Borston takes a look now at the man who will lead the nation's largest wireless carrier. A changing in the guard at Verizon. Lowell McAdam will hand the reins over to Verizon's chief technology officer, Hans Vestberg, on August 1st, showing how the leading wireless carrier is prioritizing its technology, its next generation wireless network, 5G, to stay ahead of rivals. Vestberg, formerly the CEO of Ericsson, joined the company last year to oversee the build out of Verizon's fiber infrastructure and 5G. Here's what Tim Armstrong, the CEO of Verizon's Oath Division, all of its digital content and ad businesses, said about the appointment. Impact is uh, great because it's uh, really about 5G and Verizon's been a leader in 1G to 4G. 5G is really where the world's going and today's announcement with Lowell stepping, stepping up to executive chairman and Hans coming in as CEO really s tells you how serious we are about 5G and building out the next layer of connected consumers. For us, this is a, just a pure signal, a pure leadership sign that Verizon is going to be the leader in 5G. Outgoing CEO McAdams saying of Vestberg that the board wanted somebody to be innovative with a fresh set of eyes. This comes as Verizon loses wireless subscribers to its number three mobile carrier, T-Mobile, which is positioning itself as lower cost with more perks. It recently announced a merger with the number four carrier, Sprint. Vestberg saying that with unprecedented changes in the way users interact in the digital world, the company's racing ahead to remain at the forefront of technology, connectivity, and mobility. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. It is time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. Pfizer's shares were initiated with an overweight rating in new coverage at Cantor Fitzgerald. The analyst expects Pfizer to have respectable earnings growth, despite the effect of losing exclusivity for certain products. The price target is $45. The stock finished slightly higher to $36.67. The same analyst initiated coverage of Eli Lilly with an overweight rating. The firm cites growth prospects for some key drugs. The price target is $100. The shares rose a fraction to $86.08. Dow component Chevron was initiated with a buy rating in new coverage at Mizuho Securities. The analyst there expects the company's annual oil production to grow thanks to what he calls Chevron's mega asset areas. Price target, $145. That stock was pressured, though, today by a decline in oil prices. It fell fractionally to $126.44. Domino's Pizza's rating was cut to hold from buy at maxim. The analyst cites the stock's valuation and the potential for higher labor costs as well. That price target now $270, and that's where the stock closed essentially today at $270.04. $270 Still ahead, why our market monitor says small cap energy stocks could offer some big returns. Argentina has agreed to a $50 billion loan from the International Monetary Fund. The deal requires Argentina to cut its fiscal deficit and lower its inflation rate. The loan amount was larger than expected. It is more than double what is usually granted in similar arrangements. The agreement, though, is being viewed by some as a vote of confidence in Argentina's reforms. 
A number of Democratic senators are calling for an investigation into President Trump's tweet before last Friday's employment report. In that tweet, the president said he was, quote, looking forward to the report, which he had already viewed. The senators questioned whether the president's tweet could have signified a positive report, potentially allowing for market manipulation. But they want the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the SEC, and the CFTC and the White House Council of Economic Advisors all to look into that matter. Elsewhere, the Trump administration said today it will no longer defend the Affordable Care Act from a challenge filed by 20 states, resulting in yet another new blow to the health law. The White House believes that the law's individual mandate is unconstitutional and that parts of the law are invalid, and the Justice Department is seeking to strike down key elements of the act. This latest legal filing creates more uncertainty for insurers who are trying to set rates for next year. The world's fastest computer can do in a second what it would take you and I billions of years to do. And the company behind this supercomputing machine is a name familiar to investors. Dominic Chu is in Oak Ridge, Tennessee for us tonight. Which country has the best supercomputer? You'd likely say it was the United States, and for years we did, until we lost that crown to China, but that changed today when the U.S. reclaimed the title here at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. Thanks to Summit, that's the name the Energy Department has given this latest pinnacle of human achievement. Summit is the collaboration between it, IBM, and NVIDIA, and the chiefs of all three gather to discuss. This is a great symbol of our ability to change how the world works. And together we're going to solve what are some of the most important problems. This was not illustrative. We are going to work on Alzheimer's and finding the cures. We are going to look at new materials for energy. A big driving force behind the development of Summit is to maintain American superiority in technology, something the government is very focused on. This competition's real. It's not going away. The Chinese have the two fastest computers in the world. Uh, the Swiss are next, and I think the Japanese, and, and we're in fifth place. But with this opening today, we're going to move back up to the number one spot. This is the epicenter of Summit. All of these computer banks fill up a room roughly the size of two tennis courts. And all of those computers require a lot of cooling power. So there's roughly 22,000 gallons of water flowing through here to cool all of these systems. That's roughly how much water there is in a residential swimming pool. And by the way, there is enough fiber optic cable running through these computers to stretch 180 miles. For reference, that's roughly the distance between Knoxville and Nashville, Tennessee. But this isn't just about who has the most computing power. Some CEOs have their eyes on an even bigger goal. This is not the space race. This is the race to knowledge. Knowledge is power, and the Summit supercomputer is the first of its kind built specifically for artificial intelligence applications. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Philip Morris is hiking its dividend, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The cigarette maker said that it was raising its quarterly dividend 6.5% to $1.14 a share. The new yield on that dividend will be just under 6% as a result. Shares of Philip Morris rose more than 2% today to $79.42. General Electric is leaving its dividend unchanged, at least for now. The company said that it would pay shareholders $0.12 cents a share for the current quarter, the same as last quarter. GE, as you may remember, cut its dividend in half last November, and there have been fears recently that the company, which is in the midst of a turnaround, would have to cut it once again. But not right now. Shares of GE rose 1% to date at $13.93. And EU regulators are reportedly on track to greenlight Comcast bid for European TV company Sky. Reuters says that the approval will come without concessions, as a matter of fact. Comcast shares finished uh, up a fraction to $32.08. And just as a reminder, Comcast is the parent company of CNBC, which produces this program. Apple's supplier Dialogue Semiconductor is reportedly in talks with the touchscreen technology maker, maker Synaptics about a potential merger. The news was first reported by Bloomberg. A separate report from CNBC says Synaptics rejected an offer from Dialogic in March, which valued the company at $59 a share, and that a new deal would likely be at a higher price. Shares of Synaptics climbed 10% to 47.17. 
And shares of Stitch Fix continued to rally today after the clothing subscription service blew right past Wall Street estimates after the bell last night. Today, shares finished up 26.5% to 24.88. This week's market monitor says he is putting his money to work in small cap energy names that he believes are mostly isolated from ongoing trade tensions. He also thinks that they could end the year 20 percent higher. Last time he was with us was a year ago in June of 2017. At that time, he picked Amazon, which over the last year is up 68 uh, percent. The iShares Dow Jones U.S. Regional Banks ETF, which has grown by 19 percent in the last year and First Trust Stocks European Select Dividend ETF, which is higher by 6% in the last year. We welcome back Steve Dudash, the president of IHT Wealth Management. Good to see you again. Welcome back. Uh, nice to see you, Bill. The, the small cap energy, it, it, are you just trying to avoid trade tensions by going with these? I mean, listen, we're in a trade war. Uh, it's not fun to talk about, and we're in the early innings of a trade war. Um, and we can debate the politics of it, but the reality is we have to organize our portfolios around it. And like we were talking about before uh, last year, we've been talking about jumping in small caps for 15 months now. And if you would have done that, you'd been up over 8% over what the market did last year. And we both know the market was killing it last year. And that's because they are better suited for this political environment we're in. And we, we just have to accept that. And so we're trying to take advantage of that and, and try to avoid some of the pitfalls that are probably going to come in the next year or two as the war you know, progresses. All right. So you gave us three picks. Let's start with Parsley Energy. Why do you like it? Yeah. Okay. Parsley Energy of the three, it, it's the most um, generic, to be honest with you. It, it's a fracting play. And, and you could pick a, a several in that same sector, but energy prices, like we've been talking about, are going to be hitting the 60s, 70s for quite some time. We were out there when it was in the 20s saying that's not a realistic number. It has to get up to the 60s and 70s again, and it has. And so we're taking advantage of that. And let's be honest, U.S. fracting isn't going away. It's going to continue to just continue to grow in this right. environment. They make a lot of money on it. So this is a, a smaller, again, tactical play. This is not a long-term hold. That This one is one of those you're in for a little while and you got to get out because they could be out of business in five or ten years as the environment changes. All right. No doubt. What about Synovus Energy? Synovus, yeah. I, they are just like Amazon. When you're talking about Amazon, people thought it was super pricey when we were saying to buy into it, but they had cornered the market in something. They could outcompete their peers. Synovus is the same story. They've, they can pull Canadian oil sands out cheaper than everybody else. They get it out in the $30, $35 uh, barrel range. Again, prices are going to be in the 60s and 70s for some time. They can make more money. They got rid of Conoco or they divested from each other. So we're before they had to hit 50-something dollar barrel, mm -hmm. now they're 30-something dollar barrel. Uh, they're going to profit more than their peers. They can do something cheaper. They can do something more efficient than their competitors. And let's finish Same up with story. Solaris oil field infrastructure. Uh, okay, back to the fracting play. And they happen to be the ones who provide the way of getting the, the oil out of the ground and the infrastructure that's involved in it, the technology that's involved in it. Uh, they're the backbone for that whole industry. Uh, <laughs> that, that's probably the safest of the bunch. That's the one that's going to be around for a long time, continue to do it, until fracking doesn't exist in the U.S. anymore, which, you know, it's going to be quite some time. So if you're looking for the safest of the three, that's okay. the one you could put money in and, and ride out for some time. Always good to see you, Steve. Thanks. Stephen Dudash with IHT Wealth though. Management. And okay. for more on his picks, you can head to our website at nbr.com. Anthony Bourdain was a chef, an author, a travel host, and quite a storyteller, who today was found dead of an apparent suicide. Robert Frank takes a look at the man who has turned his name into a powerful personal brand. He was called a celebrity chef, but like everything else in his life, Anthony Bourdain defied convention in his brand and his business. Bourdain came to success later in life at the age of 44 after a troubled youth with drug addiction and financial troubles, Bourdain worked in various New York kitchens and eventually rose to become executive chef at Brasserie Lazal in 1998. But his big break was the book Kitchen Confidential, which started as an article in The New Yorker and became a bestseller in 2000, selling over a million copies. He leveraged that success into a dozen more books and cookbooks, appearances on Top Chef, and three of his own TV shows. His most recent show, Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown, on CNN, was in production for its 11th season 
when he died. The show won five Emmy Awards. Now, unlike many food celebs, Bourdain did not launch a chain of restaurants or food products. He didn't even have a restaurant. He did have plans for what he called Bourdain Market, a giant food hall in lower Manhattan, but the project fell through last year. He also invested in food and travel site Roads and Kingdom. Now, Bourdain said he preferred to be called a storyteller, taking viewers to his favorite secret hideaways in remote corners of the world and asking what he said were two fundamental questions. What makes you happy and what do you eat? Bourdain is survived by his 11-year-old daughter and ex-wife, Ottavia Busia. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Robert Frank. And NBR will be right back. Facebook reportedly gave companies access to user records well after the company said it had shut off access for other developers. According to the Wall Street Journal, the company struck data sharing deals with a small number of firms. Those deals included information about a user's Facebook friends, including phone numbers. The report comes as lawmakers try to hold Facebook accountable for the way that it manages its user information. Kia is recalling about a half a million vehicles because of potentially faulty airbags. The automaker says an electronic uh, glitch may prevent the airbags from deploying in the event of a crash. The recall follows a federal investigation into four deaths and six injuries. Kia has now recalled uh, more than one million vehicles in the U.S. to address this issue. Well, it is off to the races this weekend. The three-year-old colt Justify will be competing for horse racing history at the Belmont Stakes tomorrow, hoping to become only the second horse since 1978 to capture the Triple Crown. Eric Chemi is in Elmont, New York tonight. The Belmont Stakes is not just about the excitement, it's also big business, with millions more dollars at play because of the Triple Crown. Betting on the race could reach $100 million, double a typical year. The Belmont racetrack is sold out of its 90,000 seats, and TV viewership is expected to skyrocket to an Olympic-sized 20 million people watching, rather than a typical 6 million. As far as the, um, the members or the China Horse Club's concern, the Triple Crown is a new concept for everybody. So when we explain to them, it's like uh, a Chinese Yao Ming winning the NBA. The horse's owners could cash in even more. Windstar Farms is the primary owner of Justify, and it sold sponsorship rights to a private jet company, Wheels Up, for a record amount in the seven figures. This is the largest deal in the history of horse racing for a horse. We did the deal for American Pharaoh, and we did the deal for California Chrome. We did it with Skechers with Chrome, and it was a big deal. We did Monster, the big deal with American Pharaoh, and Wheels Up. This is a bigger deal, but they get much more. They get the pants, they get the hat, they get the blanket on the horse. The race winner only gets $900,000, but the big money is in the breeding rights long after the Belmont. It's expected that Justify's breeding rights could be sold for a record $60 million. The way you look at, at buying horses and, and, and owning horses is it's really about the big, the big horse. Uh, all the horses in a group don't, don't make, don't, aren't profitable. But if you can have that one, you can have that special horse that can get you a grade one win. Uh, our goal is to have one out of each crop. If you get two or three, that's a bonus. But if you get one, you can pay for the whole crop that you bought that year. For everyone involved in Saturday's big race, the Triple Crown means a lot more money. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eric Chemi in Elmont, New York. And before we go, here's another look at the day on Wall Street. The Dow gained 75 points to close out a pretty strong week. The Nasdaq added 10, and the S&P 500 was up, up 8. And for the week, the major averages were all solidly higher. First time in a while. I know. All right. Watch the Belmont. We'll be on it. That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. And we want to remind you, this is the time of year your public television station seeks your support. I'm Bill Griffith, and we do thank you very much for that support. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you again Monday.